Amen. All right, we're here in Genesis chapter number 18. We're just going to delve into verse number 1 here immediately. Genesis 18, verse number 1 reads, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Now, verse number one here is a perfect reason why you don't draw these hard delineation lines from chapter to chapter. And that is here in verse number one, we have a word that is a pronoun. You see the word he. So it says again, one more time, and the Lord appeared unto him, there's also a pronoun, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Now, if you draw this hard line, then you have no clue who him and he is. So obviously, in this case, and everyone should be aware of who this is, you have to back up to the previous chapter. Now, in Genesis chapter number 17, of course, we're discussing Abraham right now at this point. And Abraham was just circumcised. At the very end of the chapter, he circumcised his son Isaac. He circumcised Ishmael and all of his house in that chapter. So back up. Not Isaac, I'm sorry. Ishmael. Back up to verse 25. Verse number 25. Isaac isn't born yet. Look at verse number 25. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And then it says, verse 26, in the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son. So Abraham and Ishmael and all of his house are circumcised. Then we, we jump into chapter 18, verse number 1. And it's clear that the he and the him, of course, is referring to Abraham. So you can learn from this and see that you have to have that antecedent from the last chapter. Showing that these hard lines, when people are just like, yeah, that's in the other chapter, and it has nothing to do with it, the Bible can't be read that way. Obviously, the chapters and verse numberings are helpful, they're beneficial to an extent where we can just reference things to other people, but they're not inspired. They were not in you know, the, the, the original, what we would consider the autographs, when, when Peter and all these people wrote down their scriptures, everyone in the Bible that wrote down, all the people that wrote down scripture chapters and verse numbers weren't there. So we can't go too far with that. So we see here that's a perfect example that you could take someone to to help them understand. You need chapter 17 in order to understand this here. You have to have it or it doesn't even make grammatical sense. So there, there in chapter number 18, we see something very interesting. It says, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. So we see God appearing unto him. Lord, there is Jehovah. It's all caps. Notice that. Appeared unto him, that's Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. And he, Abraham, sat in the door in the heat of the day. So this is when it's hot out is what it means in the heat of the day. Now Mamre, Mamre, if you remember in, in Genesis chapter number 13, we won't go there, but Genesis chapter number 13, uh, uh, verse number 8, I believe, is where he's, he it mentions Mamre. And it talks about, uh, when it's when uh, God appeared unto Abraham originally. When Abraham, or Abram at that time, before his name was changed, was, was there in the plains of Mamre, and he was uh, taken out, he's told to number the stars. You know, it's right there when he's, he's preaching the gospel into him for one of the very first times there, and it mentions Mamre. Now, Mamre is significant. I want to bring this up a couple of times just so you, you keep this in your mind, but Mamre is very significant. And the reason why is because it's the same city that is Kirjath Arba, which is also referred to as Arba. And it's also the same city as what? Does anybody know? Very significant. It's Hebron. Mamre is Hebron. It's the same city as Hebron. And Hebron is extremely significant. That's where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all dwell. That's like when Joseph goes out. Mamre's mentioned when Joseph uh, goes out to find his brethren and he comes back. They're living in Mamre at that time, which is Hebron. David was anointed in Hebron. David reigned from Hebron for the first seven years, and then he reigned for the, re the remaining of his time, the 33 years, obviously in Jerusalem. Many, many things. Uh, uh, Caleb was given uh, Hebron. There are tons of events that take place in Hebron. Hebron is very, very significant. And right now, that's where Abraham is located. He's in the plains of Mamre, which is Hebron. And also keep in mind, that is the same place as Kirjath Arba, or Arba. And Arba was a man, if you remember, that was a, a great among the Anakims. You remember that? So uh, that's where this is located. So it's, it's good to know where they're at right now. It's good to have an idea, like he's in Hebron, the same place that David was in later. It helps you understand the stories better, especially when you start speaking about traveling and things like that. You know how far they're traveling, and really you can understand the whole scope of the story, unless a, instead of having a shallow understanding of what's going on. So they're in Hebron or Mamre. And God appears unto them in, the heat, of the, in the, the heat of the day. This is the Lord Jehovah. Verse number 2, it says this. 
and he, that's Abra, Abraham, and he lift up his eyes and looked. And then it says this. This is interesting. We'll touch on this in a minute. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door. And then it says this, and bowed himself toward the ground. Does he sound like he's a, a prideful man? Sounds like he's a very humble man, right? He has humility. Now, he does know that this is the Lord. I've heard a lot of people say that uh, there's a verse that is very relevant to this, where the Bible talks about, I believe it's, it's the very first in, uh, verse in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, where it talks about entertaining uh, uh, angels unaware. But be not forgetful to entertain strangers, something along those lines. Uh, for some, have entertained angels unaware. That's not what this is talking about. And, I, and I'll tell you why that is, is because he knows that this is God. If you look at verse number three, it says, it says, and said, my Lord, my Lord. So he knows that this is God. It's very clear. We're going to keep reading the conversation. He knows that this is God. So I don't believe that this is what this is referring to. You know, there's other passages where people, you know, seem to be oblivious that it's an angel. There's a few other places that you could point to in the Old Testament. And, but uh, it still shows the humility of Abraham. We can still learn from the humility of Abraham. You see, he comes to God, and that's why he bows himself to the ground. He's bowing before the Lord. He knows that it's the Lord. And then he says, look, you see his humility even more so. If now I have found favor in thy sight, look at this, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So he, he's wanting God to stay with him and to tarry with him. He realizes this is the Lord. I mean, what a, what a, you know, a, a spectacular thing. To see the Lord just walking, you, you just lift up your eyes in the heat of the day and to see God, and he knew it was God. How, however, I don't, know, I don't know what he looked like. And I'm going to get to specifics on that in a minute. But I don't know exactly how he appeared and how this looked. Um, and like I said, I'll touch on that. It's, it's hard to you know, get to it right now. But everybody knows where that's going, right? But I don't want to, I don't want to get, you know, put the cart before the horse here, all right? But, you know, he looks out there, and he sees three men, and in some way he knows that one of them is God. I mean, how exciting would that be? I mean, imagine that. And he just runs to him, and he just begs him, you know, bows down before him. Please don't pass by me. Just tarry with me or stay with me for a little while. With thy servant, he says. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? Just the middle of the day, it's lunch. You're hot, maybe you're, you know, you're, you're outside working, you, you, you stand like in the doorway, you're getting a drink, and then, you know, you look out there, there's three men, and you know one of them's God. And you just run out there like, just stay with me just for a little while. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing, just to spend the day with God? I mean, how amazing, right? Look at verse number four, it says, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet. And rest yourselves under the tree. So we can see that that uh, he is he is a, a great man of hos of hospitality as well. He's being very hospitable, isn't he? I want you to turn to Romans thirteen, <clears throat> Romans chapter number thirteen, if you don't mind. Romans thirteen. We're going to look at verse. We'll, we'll begin reading in verse number ten. It says, "Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love." In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. And it says this, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. So notice there, it, this is a commandment, this is a New Testament teaching that we as Christians are to be given to hospitality. Men that would be uh, interested in being pastors, that is actually one of the qualifications to be given to hospitality. Right here, it's, uh, I like this verse because it's a perfect example of how the Bible defines itself. Look at the first part, look what it says. Distributing to the necessity of saints. What is that? It's hospitality, isn't it? And then right after that it says given to hospitality. That's a perfect definition of being given to hospitality is distributing to the necessity of saints. I go back to Genesis chapter number 18. So we see he's being hospitable. He wants, to, he wants to bring them in. He's not only providing them with somewhere where they can get water and cool down, but he's, get, he's wanting to get them food as well. So he says, verse 5, And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And, and it says this, And they said, so do, as thou hast said. So they're going to be staying with him. Look at verse 6. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make 
cakes upon the hearth. So notice Abraham's not even joining them uh, in, this, in this food. He just cares about them in this meal. He wants them to eat. He's, he's worried and concerned about them eating. Look at verse 7. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good. So he chose out the best, right? When, well, what do we do when we give something to God? We give them the best, don't we? You want, when they're supposed to sacrifice in the Old Testament law, what do they do? They're supposed to give the best. Without blemish, they're supposed to be perfect. And what does Abraham do? He goes out, he's looking, and what does he find? And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf, and it says, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. So he's preparing it. Verse 8, and he took butter and milk, and it says, and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree. This is further proof that Abraham himself is not, is not eating. It says this, and they did eat. So he's standing by them under the tree and they're just eating. Showing again his hospitality, how he cares about them. <clears throat> Verse 9, it says, and they said unto him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now this is almost the exact statement that we would have read last week in Genesis chapter 17. If you look over there in verse number 21, it says this, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee. And he said this, At this set time in the next year. So this makes me think, that maybe this was exactly three months later, he appears unto them again, and then maybe the nine months go by. Or maybe this happened immediately thereafter. But it's, it's one of those two because there's something specific about this time. About this time exactly when he comes unto them. Because he says in verse 21, at this set time. Then you look over, and that was 21 in chapter 17. Then you look over where we were just reading, and it was verse 10. In chapter 18, verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to to the time of life. So keep reading there again. We'll, we'll finish verse 10 once more. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. So the tent is just directly behind him. Not, this tree is obviously located somewhat uh, adjacent to the tent. And, and Sarah is in earshot. She's able to hear what they're saying. It says in verse 11, Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. Now I want to focus on this for a minute. I've alluded to it past couple weeks, it says this, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Now, <clears throat> I, I want you to turn to Matthew 1, 23. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 23. I mentioned this uh, last week, and I believe I mentioned it one other time as well. Uh, how Isaac, of course, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, you can prove that many ways. You see Isaac is taken in, in uh, Genesis uh, chapter number 22 to Mount Moriah, and he pictures the father sacrificing the son. Isaac is directly the seed that is being promised, but specifically that promise is given uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. The very next seed is, uh, of Abram was Isaac, of which Jesus would ultimately come of that line. The promise was, was really, and in, in truth, given to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see Isaac being you know, uh, the, the very first figure, if you will, in the promise of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Isaac was conceived in the exact same manner that the Lord Jesus Christ was. I want you to look in Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 23, a very famous verse. Of course, this is quoted from uh, Isaiah 7, 14. It says in Matthew 1, 23, it says this, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, there in the beginning of verse number 23, it makes the statement, Behold, a virgin, a virgin shall be with child. What is the probability of that, scientifically? Zero. zero. There is zero probability. That, that is impossible, isn't it? It's impossible, scientifically speaking. It is not possible in this natural world for that to occur. It's not possible. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 18. I want you to understand... The, 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 the strong parallel here and how strong it is between Sarah and Mary. Mary. Mary was not able to have children. It's impossible. The probability is zero. It's not possible. A virgin cannot have a child scientifically. 
Genesis chapter number 18, verse number 11 says, Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And then it says this, And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Now, of course, when it's referring to the manner of women, there's a time in which a woman's life when she can have children. You know, later on, you know, they go through, I believe, what is referred to as menopause. Is that correct? And then after that, they can't have kids anymore. It is, it is not possible. It, their body is no longer, it, I mean, the probability is zero. They, a woman gets to an age where there is zero probability of her having children any longer. It's exactly the same, scientifically, of a virgin having a child. A virgin having a child is exact. Now, both of them, zero possibility, zero probability. But what happened with, of course, uh, Sarah? She brought forth a son, didn't she? When it was no, no chance of that. It was not possible. What happened with Mary? Brought forth a son. Sarah brought forth a son what? And it was Abraham's seed. Who was it? It was Isaac. Who, of course, pictured the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, so greatly, of course, in Genesis 22. And who did Mary bring forth? You know, him, him truly. Those of whom shadow him all throughout the Old Testament. You see just the perfect parallel between who? Sarah and Mary. That's what this picture is with Sarah. She, she, God waited. Think about this. God waited until it was impossible. Abraham's wondering, like, what's going on? You know, why is, has so much time went on? And then obviously it comes to the point where, where his wife is not even possible of having children. And Abraham's probably thinking, like, now what are we going to do? Yeah, I, I don't know if he's, like, not aware of this. You, know, you never know what, you know, because you think humanly stupid sometimes, even when you're thinking about how God is, you know? So he's probably thinking, like, what is God waiting on? You know what he was waiting on was to be a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ to come one day. Amen. It's exact. It's the exact same thing. Exactly. And I want to show you even a stronger parent or a stronger proof of that. Once you look down at verse 14, notice what this says. <laughs> Let's read through here, and then I'll back up, because there's something in verse 12 I want to touch on that's unrelated. Look at verse 12. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? So notice, she's like laughing, because I'm sure she understands how, you know, the human body works in relation to the female, right? She knows, like, it's not possible for me to have children anymore. It's not physically possible. Look at verse 13. And the Lord said unto Abraham... Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child which am old? Verse 14. <coughs> Is anything too hard for the Lord? What a great statement. Yeah. Think about that. Is anything too hard for the Lord? So he knows she's laughing, and she's saying, like, it's impossible for me to have children. And then he makes the statement to Abraham, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse 17. So this phrase, this exact phrase is used twice. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. It's used one time. Jeremiah 32, 17, it says this. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. And then he says this. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Right here in this same chapter, look down at verse number 27. It says this. Verse number 27 of Jeremiah 32. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And it says this. Is there anything too hard for me? It's almost that exact same statement that was made in Genesis 18. Now I want you to go to Luke chapter number 1, verse number 35. Now this will be a very familiar verse, of course, to all of us. Luke chapter number 1, verse number 35. This is the announcement made unto Mary. Unto Mary... When she is going to be bringing forth her firstborn son. Look at verse number 35. It says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now if we back up in verse number 34, let's read that quickly. It says, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this, this be? Seeing I know not a man. So she understands, like, it's not possible for me to have a child, right? You see the strong parallel between her and Sarah? 
Skip down to verse 36 and watch this. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she out, she had also conceived a son in her and conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Now look at verse 37. For with God nothing shall be impossible. So notice that strong parallel. When he's speaking unto Abraham about Sarah, he makes the statement in Genesis chapter number 18, verse number 14, is anything too hard for the Lord. When he's speaking about Sarah bearing a child, when it is past her time as far as the manner of women, when it's impossible for her to have children, and what is Sarah, what's her attitude about it? She's laughing, she's like, this is ridiculous, this can't happen. And then God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Speaking about himself, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Then we look in Luke chapter number one, when the angel is speaking to Mary, and how's Mary acting? How is this going to happen? How, how, can, how shall this thing be, seeing I know not a man? Like saying, what is she saying? This is impossible, right? And then he explains right after that that nothing's impossible for God. Nothing's impossible for God. So here's the thing. What did it say in Jeremiah 32, 17? It says that he created the world with his outstretched arm. He made the heaven and the earth, and it said that nothing's too hard for him. I mean, if you stop and you think about it, he is the God of this universe. Nothing existed, not a particle, not an atom, nothing. There was nothing, and then God said, let there be light. And then God spoke everything in this world to existence. Everything. How hard do you think it would be if God can create all of this from nothing? This is his creation in the first place. How hard would it be for him to alter his own creation? That he just speaks and it's done. I mean, it's... There's no effort. It, you couldn't even. You can't even say, "Well, he has to work this hard. He has to work." There's no effort involved at all. He did. It, it, you couldn't. You couldn't put it on a scale. There's nothing too hard for him. Amen. Now, some people will confuse this, and, and, and some people will say, "You know, well, you know, then God can do anything," and that's not right. God cannot do any. God cannot do everything. The Bible is very clear on things that God cannot do, and one of them specifically. Obviously, we know that God cannot do something that is, that is sinful or wrong. And the Bible is very clear on one specific thing a couple of different times in the book of Numbers and also in Titus. And in Titus, you know, chapter number one, verse number two, the Bible says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot do everything. God cannot lie. So you, you got to, these are not the same, these are not, you know, they don't go into the same category. It's not the same question. Now, when we look at this world, we look at the, uh, the physics and the science of this world. He created the laws. He created the way that a woman's body works in the first place. You don't think he can reverse the, the order and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the design of that woman you know, at any time that he wanted? It, it, it's foolishness when you really stop and think about it. The same God that spoke this world into existence, how hard would it be for him to just cause a woman just to have a child? Foolishness when you stop and think about it. You know what? It really just helps you magnify the power that God really has. How powerful and great he really is. I love that statement, and it's God saying it himself. Yeah. Remember, I preached that sermon about a God, you know, God glorifying himself, and he does all the time. He can. God can glorify himself. Man. You know why? Because he's great. He really is great. Man. You know, we aren't. That's why it's sinful. Don't tell me about how great you are because you're not great. All right. <laughs> God is great. God can stand up and he can talk about how great he is. He can talk about all the great things that he's done, all the things he's created. He can say that. You know why? Because it's true. That's why. Amen. Look at what he says. Verse 14. This is God. God boasting. You know what he says? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing. There's nothing too hard for God. Look at verse. Uh, look at the end of verse 14. Keep reading. At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, like I said, there was something I want to touch on real quickly. I want you to go back to verse number 12. I want you to get in your other hand. Go back to the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter number 3. So turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3. That's 1 Peter chapter number 3. I'm going to read to you quickly from Genesis uh, 18, where we're at, verse number uh, verse number 11, or verse number 12 again, it says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? And then she says this, My Lord being old, 
also. Now, who's she referring to when she says, my Lord? She's speaking of Abraham, of course, right? Look at 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1. It says this. <clears throat> Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any man, that if any, I'm sorry, that if any, if any, obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Look at verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Now look at the example that's given. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So we look here in 1 Peter chapter number 3, and to New Testament Christians, specifically to, to women in the New Testament, the example of the, of the women in the Old Testament that's pointed to is Sarah. We see that. And she's referred to, which is a great title to have, she's actually referred to as, it says, the holy women also. I mean, isn't that great that the Holy Spirit speaks of you that way? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to be spoken as of a, of a holy man, if you're a man, or a holy woman, if you're a woman? I mean, that's a great title that Sarah was given. You notice in verse number 6, it says, even as, it's going to give you a specific example in the way in which Sarah obeyed Abraham, because it's talking about being in subjection to your own husbands. It says, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, it says, calling him Lord. Now, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 18, because this is actually where you find this taking place. In Genesis chapter number 18. So look there in Genesis chapter number 18, verse 12 again. It says, therefore Sarah laughed within herself. So is she speaking this out loud? She's not. She's laughing within her. She's speaking amongst herself. She's like you're talking to yourself like you say things in your own mind. She's not even saying this out loud. She's in the tent. She's not outside with them. You understand? She's by herself. So she's just talking in her own mind to herself. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying... After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? And then she says, my Lord, being old also. You know what that tells you? That Sarah's not just like putting on a front when she is obeying her husband. She's speaking unto her, under herself, like in her own heart, in her own mind. And the title, the, she doesn't even say Abraham. Abraham being old also. I mean, think about that. She says, my Lord, being old also. Now, obviously, the word Lord is not like my God, right? The word Lord is, is a word that just means like sir, right? That, you know, uh, even like in many, many languages, even like in Greek, in like the New Testament, the same word there that we saw that was used for Lord in 1 Peter 3 where we were just reading, that word curious, that's the same word that's used when it talks about God saying Lord. Many languages, they'll have the same word, but one is more has more of a, uh, a more of a leaning or a connotation of like just sir, just to a regular man of of just respect, and then the and then it'll also be used that same word will also be used, and it will uh, it will it will mean you know God speaking like Lord as in God right in Spanish. What's the word for Lord in Spanish? What did you say? No, 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 not God. Yeah. What would what'd you say? What'd you say? Senor. Senor, yeah, it's just Senor, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I was looking for, not God, not Dios, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, Senor, it just, it just means Lord. And that, that word you'll just say to like, you know, Brother Rick, lived in Tucson for a long, a long time. I'm sure you just heard people respectfully just saying that constantly, didn't you? I'm sure all the time. But if you want to say the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what you say? Senor Jesus Cristo. That's what you would say in Spanish. So notice it's the same word, but all the time you'll hear people, if you're being respectful to your elders, they would just say senor. It's the, that, so don't let that word, don't, make, don't think like, oh, you know, Sarah's, you know, uh, she's saying that he's basically on God's status. That's not what this is saying. It's a difference in our language today. The word Lord to us just means God. I don't actually think about that, but most languages it's not that way. Most languages, the word Lord is used for God, and it's also just used the same word in a respectful manner. 
Uh, we see here that Sarah had a great respect for her husband. That even within herself, she's not putting on a front. She's not faking it. She obviously holds her husband to a high regard, even in her own mind, doesn't she? Where she just says, my Lord being old also. Because why? Because men are the boss, right? There's nothing, you know, that doesn't mean that, that God is down on women. We're designed differently. And men are meant to be the boss. And it's good when women will just go, when they'll, they will obey God and they will be in subjection to their own husbands. And it's good when men will go into their position and do what they're supposed to do too. You know, we are different and we should be in the positions that God created us for. God designed you. He knows what's best for you. Obviously, the person that designs a washer, he knows how it's supposed to operate, right? The person that designs a dryer knows how it's supposed to operate. You know, you can't get him to do the other's job. It's not going to work. So why not just go with the designer's plan? Read the instructions and do what the, what the person that the, the person that wrote the instructions that made, that designed that, do what he said to do. That's how it's going to work best. That, that will, you know, uh, that, then you'll be able to uh, live a happy life. Look at, uh, look at verse number 13 now. It says, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Now, what's very interesting, this just occurred to me a moment ago, actually, when I was reading through here, and I wish I had uh, where, this is, where this takes place. I believe it's like Matthew 9 or Matthew 10. If somebody doesn't mind, look it up on your phone real quick. So uh, this is when Jesus is there, and he's speaking. Uh, he's in a group of people, and man, when you're on the spot like this, I, if I was in my office, I would think this, think, I would recall this immediately. It's when Jesus is there, and somebody says something you know, uh, in his heart. You know what I'm referring to? Yeah, and then, uh, and then Jesus just like reads, the, reads you know, the guy's mind, basically. That's the only other time that I can think of this happening in the Bible. I don't think that this occurs any other time. Now, who do you think this is here that's standing with Abraham? Amen. You think that's a coincidence? The only other time that that occurs in the Bible? Does anybody have it or know where it's at? Matthew 9. Matthew 9. I thought it was Matthew 9 or Matthew 10. Okay, Matthew 9. Matthew, go to Matthew chapter number 9. Yeah. It, is it? Did I think wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah, this is the story. Yeah, yeah, right there in the beginning. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, look at uh, Matthew 9. Look at uh, verse number 2. Just begin right there. Behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, laying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now watch this. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Verse 4, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. So, notice what happens there. Jesus is there, just, just, just standing there. You know, Jesus is, uh, is, is talking to this man. He's getting ready to heal this man. And then, what do the, the scribes and the Pharisees say? They're thinking evil things in their hearts. And Jesus, because he's God, he's not a normal man, Jesus knows their thoughts, doesn't he? He knows what they're thinking in their mind, right? And he answers them according to their thoughts. Now go back to Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis chapter number 18. Look at verse number, we're going to read 12 and 13 uh, as a couple one more time. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, be, being old also. Verse 13. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child? Which of old? So we see in the New Testament the Lord Jesus Christ when he's living his, his, his earthly life. He's there. The same scenario happens, right? And you know what we see here? We see the Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. Before he's born as a man, the exact same situation. It's the only time that I believe that that happens with God. I, I would almost guarantee it. Because God didn't appear to people very hardly ever did God ever you know, appear on the earth before his carnation, incarnation. So you know what you have? One time where the Lord in the Old Testament, you know, uh, reads someone's mind and then responds to it. And then we have you know, an, an example in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. You know what I'm just trying to point you to? It's the same person. Yeah. It's the same guy. It's the Lord Jesus Christ here appearing in 
the Old Testament as well. I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. So then it says, keep reading there, verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Talking about the due date, of course. Verse 15. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Now there's a couple of interesting things about this verse. Number one is, you know, <coughs> I've heard it said, and I believe that this is very true, and this is a very profound statement. That any time someone lies, that there's a reason. And do you know why they lie? It's because they're afraid. Now, I want you to look at this verse, verse, verse 15. Then Sarah denied. So what is she doing? She's denying, and is it true? Or she's lying right now. She denied, saying, I laugh not. Why? For she was afraid. Think for a second. Why do your children lie to you? Every time. It's because they're afraid of something. Anytime someone does not tell the truth, do you know why they're not telling you the truth? It's because they're afraid. Normally of the punishment that's going to be brought out. You know why someone lies when they're brought before a judge? Because they're afraid of the consequences. You know why someone lies to you? It's because they're afraid to tell the truth. Isn't that interesting? Anytime anyone ever lies, you know what the reason is? Because they're afraid. And you see that taught as a principle in the Bible because the Bible doesn't have to tell you those. If you notice that, God doesn't have, like, that didn't have to be in there before she was afraid. But God, you know, he teaches these little subtle nuggets of points, just, just facts of life all throughout the Bible. And when you really contemplate that one little truth, it's, it's true in every area of life. You know, if, if your child sticks his hand in the cookie jar and you ask him, and he did, and you say, did you get a cookie out of there? He says, no, I didn't. Why did he lie? Because he was afraid. You know, isn't that interesting? And you see Sarah. What was the reason? She was afraid. So then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And then it says this. And he said, nay, but thou didst laugh. That's how God is. You know, he's not a pushover. You see that? She, she, you know, he's not just going to let it slide. She's like, it's obviously, you know, he, you know obviously, uh, you know, God is a merciful God. He's a forgiving God. But he's there with her, and she's trying to lie to him, and he's not putting up with it, is he? He's like, hey, but thou didst laugh. You know, he wasn't going to let her just lie and then just walk away, right? He was going to point out to her, like, I know. And imagine how fearful, how fearful that would be if you're thinking in your mind, like you're in the other room, and you're just like, what's he talking about, right? And then you hear him say, like, you know, what, he said, what did he say exactly? Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, shall, shall I of a surety bear a child which am, of, which am old? And the laughing wasn't an audible laugh. It was just like, just like laughing in your mind. How scary would that be? Like, why did she just laugh? She just like laughed in her mind. That'd be pretty scary. Look at verse number 16 now. And the men arose, and the men, I'm sorry, and the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. So they just rose up, and it looks like maybe they, maybe they walked, or they just looked in that direction. Looked toward Sodom, and Abram, yet it does look like they traveled at least a little bit, and Abram went with them to bring them on the way. So they're traveling a little bit. Verse 17, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing, which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Abraham is called uh, the friend of God or a friend of God three times in the Bible. And I believe that this is a very, uh, a very uh, good benefit of being a friend of God. So notice he said, shall I hide the thing which I do from, from Abraham? And what's the reason why? He starts talking about how he's, he's obedient and how he's going to train you know, uh, his, those of his household to be obedient as well and to keep his commandments. And because of that, God is what? He's revealing things to Abraham. He's showing truths unto Abraham because of his obedience. You see the benefits of being a friend of God. And that's how you become, when you study in the Bible, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So if we love God, you know, if we, uh, we keep God's commandments, we'll establish a close relationship. We can be, have, you know, have a, a, a friendship with God. You know, Abraham is referred to as a friend of God. Wouldn't that be great for God to, to, to think of you and, 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 and you to think of God and on, on the level of a friendship? I mean, isn't that an amazing thought? And that's, that's how Abraham's relationship was with God. It was a, a friendship. 
Look at, uh, look at verse number 20 now. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. Now, does God already know? He just read Sarah's thoughts. Does God already know? Of course he does. The reason why I think that he's, he's sending these, these men, which we're going to see in a moment, are angels into Sodom and Gomorrah is because God is a just judge. God already knew what they were doing, but you know what he does? He sends them in there. Of course, they, they go in there as well to retrieve Lot, but he says they're going there to know whether it's true, whether it's not. He just wants to have somebody on the ground, have somebody there. They're going to see it, and then they're going to be able to testify against them. And that's the same way when, when, you know, when, when people stand you know, before God one day, God, you know, they're gonna, God's going to be sitting on a throne before them. It's going to be a real judgment. And God knows everything that took place in your life. Like he knows the beginning from the ending. He's going to have time. He's going to bring up times in your life when he knows. When they say, I never knew the gospel. God's going to say, that's not true. There was this time when this person came to your door and they quoted to you John 3.16 and you understood it. And you knew what they said. You understood the gospel. They're going to have no excuse, are they? That God is a just judge. Look at, uh, I want you to look at verse 22, because I want to look at this for a few minutes now. It says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now, two things I want to focus on. Notice right here, they're, they're referred to as men. And the men turned their faces from thence and it says, And went toward Sodom. Look at Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. It says this, And there came two angels to Sodom at even. So I want you to notice there it says that these, the, these, these men that came into Sodom, well, what are they in Genesis 19.1? They're angels. So men and angels, well, sometimes those words will be used interchangeable. Angels will be referred to as men. Men will be referred to as angels. Now, when they get into Sodom and uh, Gomorrah, the, this, this area, these cities, that no one just knows, like, hey, these are angelic beings. Hey, these are, you know, celestial beings. No one just knows that, do they? Of course, we know the story of how they, they try to rape them, right? And they just think they're normal men. They're new people, obviously, because they're, they, they're disgusting. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah, the, those people are, are perverts. So they're just trying, they just think they're just new men, right? There's nothing that stands out about them. You couldn't look at them and identify them. As an angel automatically. That's why Hebrews 13 says that you might not know whether you're entertaining angels. You might entertain angels unaware. That proves that angels just look like men a lot of times, right? The, the, the only uh, angelic beings or other ones that, that, that would be, we would refer to as angels would be the seraphims and the cherubims. Now, if you saw one of them suckers, you're not going to be wondering, like, is this a man? You know, it's pretty obvious. They got like six faces or, you know, four faces. You're like, it's obvious, you know. That this is not a man. These other angels, they look like a normal person. Just like look like me and you. Isn't that a strange thought? Walking down the street, and that's an angel or a messenger that's been sent from heaven. These two men, you had they had you were not able to tell them apart from a normal person. Just living on this earth. That's a that's a crazy thought. Look back there at uh, at Genesis chapter 18. And look at verse number, look at verse number 22. Again, I want to focus on another portion of this now. So we see the men there are angels, but then it says this, but Abraham, look at this statement, stood yet before the Lord. Now, when we looked over at Genesis 19, it says there came two angels. So there was two of them, the angels, which are the men that were here in Genesis 18. If you back up in Genesis chapter 18, you look at verse number... Um, yeah, it's verse 2. There it is. It says, verse 2, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and it says, and lo, three men stood by him. So notice there's three men standing there. Two of them are what? Angels. angels. We see that from Genesis 19, 1, don't we? Two angels. But then it tells you in verse number 22, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So who's the third person? Jesus. This is God, of course. This is the Lord. We'll get to that in just a minute, but it's Jesus. It's the Lord. It's Jehovah. You see that this is capital L, capital O, R, D. All four letters or characters are capitalized. That is referring to Jehovah. 
So Jehovah is standing here. Jehovah is there. He came with them, and all three of them ate. God ate with Abraham with these other two men. And then he stayed behind, and he stood here, and he spoke with Abraham. I want you to go to Colossians chapter number 1, verse number 12. Now, <clears throat> there are Old Testament appearances of God. There are Old Testament appearances of God. There are many times in the Old Testament, there are times in the Old Testament, let me say that, where, where uh, there, there is a specific time, the most famous time, where Moses is requesting to see God, right? And God tells him, he tells him, you know, just plainly that no man can see me. No man can see my face and live. So no one can see him. He, and he only shows him just a little bit of his back parts, right? So obviously it's not just exclusive to his face. You can't just look upon God. Why? Because of his great glory. You know, Moses going up into the mount, just standing there and not even seeing God, came down and his face shone, so that, whereas he had to wear a veil on his face. Because you see the great glory of God, you can't just look straight at God, can you? It's not possible. You cannot just look at God. You can't look upon him. We have Old Testament appearances of God, though. Now, the only way to explain this, the only way to explain this is the New Testament teaching of God being the Lord Jesus Christ. God being the man, Christ Jesus. I want you to look at Colossians chapter number 1, verse number 12. It says this, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of, sa of the saints in life, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So he translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And then it says this, In whom? Referring to the Son, that's Jesus, of course. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And it tells us this. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So notice Colossians chapter number 1 tells you that the Son, the image, is the, in, is the, I'm sorry, the Son is the image of the invisible God. God is invisible. God is a spirit, the Bible says. You cannot see him. No, you know, the, uh, God said in the Old Testament to Moses, no man can see me and live. No man can see my face and live. It's not possible to see God. When we get to John chapter number 1, the Bible talks about in John 1, the Word being made flesh, God being made flesh, and it says that he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. We were able to look and see the glory. You know what, that, you know what that's referring to? It says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the, of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know what it's referring to? It's referring to the, it tells you in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you get to John 1, I believe it's 14, it says, and the Word was made flesh. Who is the Word? It's God. Who was speaking to Moses? God. He said, you can't see me. Why couldn't they see him? Because of his glory. That's why. See, in John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. God was made flesh, right? Of course, I believe that that was literally his word, but both are true. The word was made flesh, and God was made flesh. The word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you know what's significant about that verse? Is it's teaching that they were able to behold God's glory now. That's what it is. Moses you know, was able in some sense to stand there before God and see his glory. And his glory was so great that his face shone when he left. But even then, God said, you can't see my face. You know what happened was God, so that we could know him, God, so that we could see him, God, so that he could be made manifest. In the New Testament, we know that God became a man and he was born. And it's Jesus, the Son, the man Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God. God was manifest in the flesh. The Bible says in Colossians 1, what I just quoted, it says, Who, it's Jesus, that's the Son, is the image of the invisible God. He is the image. There is no other image of God outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Hebrews chapter number 1. We'll see this one more time. Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners 
spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory. So notice he's the brightness of his glory. And then it says, and the express image of his person. So the Bible says that Jesus is the express image of God the Father's person. The Son, specifically here, is the express image of God the Father's person. Notice the, the, the phrase there, express image. That is the way that, that God, what it's saying is that he expresses or makes himself known to us is through his Son. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We get to, you know, uh, the book of Revelation. The Bible says that they shall see his face. And then it says, and his name shall be, on their, shall be in their foreheads. You know who's, who he's speaking about? It's the throne of God and of the Lamb. Amen. Well, the Lamb is God. Amen. So you know whose face they're going to see? They're going to see the Lamb's face. Do you know whose face they're going to see? They're going to see God's face. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Do you know who that was? That was Jesus. That was the Son, right? The Son of God. That was God born as a man. In bodily form, and they were able to look at him and see him, right? Amen. Let's go back to the Old Testament now. Go back to Genesis chapter number 18. Now, there's a few times where God, very few, it's, it's not very common, but there are very few times where God appears in the Old Testament. Now, everyone agrees with this. Everyone agrees that all of the appearances in the Old Testament are Jesus Christ showing up. You know, that, that is, you know, as far as the appearances of God, when God appears, everyone, everyone agrees that these are appearances of Jesus. Jesus Christ. This is referred to as Christophanies, right? Like, uh, opony, that just means to appear. Like if someone says, uh, I just had an epiphany, right? That means that something just appeared in your mind, right? You just, you just thought of that, right? There was also people referred to as uh, theophanies, and that's Old Testament appearances of God. But let me say this. A theophany and a Christophany are exactly the same. Because Christ is God. And anytime right. you see God, you see Christ. Why? You have, you have a scripture for that? The word the is a definite, definite, I'm sorry, a definite article. The. He is the image of the invisible God. Amen. The image. There is no other image. Show me one time in the Bible where there's somebody else that's representing or looks like God or, you know, in the image of God. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. It doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. He is the image of the invisible God. God is invisible. And the sun is his image, right. so that you can see him. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Plain and simple. Amen. Jehovah's standing here, Abraham's looking at him, and you know who he's looking at? Jesus. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, God had not been, you know, God was not manifest in the flesh yet, was he? God was not, you know, uh, the, the word was not made flesh yet. It wasn't. You know, God was in heaven, he was dwelling in heaven, and he was in the same situation with Moses that takes place a little bit after this. He did not take on or assume the form of a man yet, right? Look at Genesis 18, verse number 14 again. We read this a moment, a moment ago. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You know what happened? Was God is eternal. God was going to be born as a man. You know what he did? He wanted to speak face to face to Abraham, and he appeared as the image of the invisible God. He appeared as the Son and he spoke face to face. However you interpret this, that was Jesus Christ standing before him. Amen. That, was, that was Jesus Christ standing there and speaking to Abraham. Now, you know, true modalists that live today are one as Pentecostals. And they really believe in what is modalism. It's modes. Now, the man that I spoke to, Daniel Huba, he rejects that term of modes. But what he describes are modes. He believes that God throughout the Old Testament, you know, could appear in different forms. He said he could have appeared as the angel of the Lord, and he would just look, he would look different than Jesus. And because I, I actually told him, you know, that that I believe that anytime anybody ever sees God, it's Jesus. Anytime. Old Testament, New Testament. That's true modalism. That's God changing into something, changing out of something. You know, uh, he, he becomes like a, an angel of the Lord where he's like a man. 
But it's like, it's like just, he just like takes on this form that's not really him, right? He takes on a body that's not really like what he looks like. That's not the same as Christ appearing to someone here in the Old Testament. God is eternal. God, it says, you know, uh, in uh, Isaiah, I can't remember exactly where it's located, but God makes the statement, you know, thus saith the high and lofty one, he says, that inhabiteth eternity. So God dwells in eternity. God, you know, he knows the beginning from the ending. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. God, at any time, you know, he doesn't, things don't work for him like they work for us, like the beginning of our life, the end of our life, where like all, everything's happening in order. That's not how it works. God, the reason why God knows what's going to happen in a hundred years, it's not like, you know, he just, he's just, you know, able to like prophesy things. No, it's because he's been there. Because he's there now. He, he dwells in eternity. He sees all things all at the, all at the same time. It's, is anything too hard for the Lord, especially once you understand the, the eternality of God? He at any moment could just appear and look like the man Christ Jesus. Even before he became flesh. You know, what we have is the word of God here appearing. The man Christ Jesus appears. God is a man. He looks like a man. And it is the image of the invisible God. There's no other explanation for it. There's no way around it. But here's the problem that some people will, that I wanted to address real quickly. Here's the problem that, that, that people will try to like get around in ways. You know, so the Bible, as far as like how we live our lives, right? As human beings, things are beginning to end, right? The Bible is a story of, of creation of human history, isn't it? And things happen from our perspective in order, don't they? And there was a time in which, in creation, when God became a man, isn't there? There's a time in which, from our perspective of life, when the Word was made flesh, isn't there? Now, the Bible's very clear that at the moment that the Word was made flesh, that that was Jesus becoming the Son, like we read in Luke 1.35, right? Now, in John 1.14, it says the Word was made flesh. When did that happen, approximately, in history? 2,000 years ago, right? 2,000 years ago. There was a point in time within creation, and from our perspective, in which God became a man, right? Now, I understand from God's you know, perspective, God dwells in eternity. But you don't. Okay, And we can't wrap our minds around how this works exactly. We can't wrap our minds around, you know, obviously you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of questions from our perspective. But the Bible uses the language, the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. So was the word flesh before that? No. No. There's, that's, that's, it's just, that's what the word means. There's no way around. So... Here's, here's, here's basically what's going on, and you have no other options besides this. Jesus is the express image of God. When you see God, you see Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, period. There's no other way around that. God never appears to anyone else in any other body, form, anything. Jesus is the image of God, period, okay? But there was a time in which the Word was made flesh. Now, how did this work exactly? Did God just cause himself to appear because he dwells you know, uh, in, in eternity with the body that he would receive later on? From our perspective, I'm speaking, of course, that's what would make the most sense. But the two, these are the two things we walk away from. Abraham saw Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. But we have to understand that there was a time in which when the word was actually made flesh. Right. Those, those things are true. The word was made flesh. That's the tense of the word. That's what the word means. Okay? In the Old Testament, <clears throat> God had not been born as a man yet. The word was not made flesh. But does that limit God from, be, from showing up and, and, and appearing? You know, the word of God appearing in the flesh right there? It doesn't, does it? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, that's just what the Bible teaches. If you see... If you're able to see God, you're going to see Jesus. You're going to see the Son of God. Amen. But that doesn't negate this other truth that the Word was made flesh at a certain point in time. The Word was made flesh. I mean, it's a very simple concept. Now, can you wrap your mind around all of it? No. Why? Why? Because you can't understand. That's God. That's why. Because you can't understand His nature and how He dwells outside of time and how He operates. 
So look at verse 23. Mm -hmm. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that, that are therein? Verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now, I do believe that Abraham right now is making intercession for Lot. He knows that Lot is dwelling in the city, and, uh, and he knows that, that, that Lot is a righteous man as far as he is saved, right? The Bible talks about how he vexed his soul. How he's a righteous man, he vexed his soul. Just Lot, righteous or just, just Lot vexed his soul, right? That's what's going on uh, in this situation is he's making intercession for Lot. Now, in verse number 25, I'm just going to read the rest of these scriptures because it's getting a little bit late. I wanted to, uh, to cross-reference a couple of verses because it says there, That be far from thee, that be far from thee to do after this manner, it says, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the righteous obviously he's, he's for sure referring to, to Lot, but he's saying... You know, you're the judge of all the earth. Shouldn't you do right? That, that's not something you would do. That's far from something you would do, right? That's far from something you would do to kill the righteous with the wicked or to treat the righteous like the wicked, right? Well, this is a perfect picture. What happens in uh, Solomon and Gomorrah is a perfect picture of when the rapture takes place. Because, you know, when, right when the rapture takes place is when? It's right before God's wrath. And what do you see happening here in just a moment, or, or next week we'll read about this in Genesis 19. You see God you know, sends in these angels, and these angels serve two purposes. Number one, they're there to see and to, and to testify the wickedness. And number two, they actually bring out the righteous, don't they? They bring Lot, and Lot is able to deliver some of his family. Because, you know, the Bible actually says, by his righteousness. That's not, of course, you know, spiritual salvation. That's physical salvation. He's able to deliver some people with him, his family. Okay? The Bible actually refers to that in Ezekiel later on. But he, uh, so he ends up taking them with him at this point. The Bible referred in Matthew, you, you can write this down, it's Matthew 13, 47. I'm not going to turn there because we don't have time, but it's Matthew 13, 47 is actually a parable. Jesus tells a few parables right in a row where he's talking about how God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. He also talks about the parable about if you cast out a net and you bring things back, there's going to be good things and bad things, right? And what do they do? You separate it out, right? And it, it mentions, it actually uh, uh, speaks of the event that takes place in Revelation 14, which is the rapture. And what happens is Jesus comes down. He, he, saw, he sees the Son of Man with a sickle in his hand, you know, and the, it's ready. Everything's ready to reap. What's going on? You know, points back to that parable. In Matthew 13, that's told right after the last one when the angels come, right? The angels come and they take away the righteous, and then what does he do? He destroys the wicked. This is a perfect picture of the rapture taking place and God delivering the righteous because he's the judge of all the earth and he will do right. He won't destroy the righteous with the wicked. He'll deliver the righteous and then he'll give the, the punishment unto the wicked. So this is a perfect picture of that. Look at verse 26. We're just going to read through the the rest of this chapter, and we'll be finished for the night. Verse 26, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. <clears throat> and Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty, I'm sorry, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Verse 32. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it 
for ten sake. Verse 33, and the Lord went his way. So there was not, we know, of course, that Sodom and Gomorrah, these, these cities, uh, ultimately were destroyed. That means that there were not ten uh, righteous people there. He did not spare the city. He ended up destroying the city. There was not even ten righteous people in this city. He only delivered Lot. Now it says in verse 33, and the Lord went his way, showing further that the Lord was standing before Abraham. But then it says this, very interesting. As soon as he had left, it says communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. So that's interesting that it ends with uh, the fact that they, that they were communing one with another. You know, we refer to communion, right? What is that? When, uh, when uh, you know, we, we, we take the Lord's Supper, it's also referred to as? It's, it's a, another word for fellowship. Do you know what? Abraham and God were standing face to face. It kind of goes back to how we started at the beginning. How interesting would that be if you saw three men and you just knew, hey, that's God right there. Isn't that an interesting thought? And you bring a man like, hey, sit down and eat and everything. And then you just commune with God. You spoke to God. It says he, he, he left off or ended communing with God. And then, you know, it says that, that the Lord went his way. I mean, that's an interesting thought. That, you know, he, he, he's referred to as the friend of God. You know, you should strive for a relationship like that. You know how you speak to God? Through prayer. You pray, you speak to him, and then he speaks to you through his word. Amen. That's how. You can have a true relationship with God. You can have a true friendship with God. You know, when you really understand the concept and the, of the greatness of the Bible, the Bible says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Really understanding that these words are God, it can strengthen the concept. When you sit down with your Bible, I mean, you are communing with God. He is really speaking to you. This is the Lord. Not this book, but these words. That is the Lord. You know, that is, a, that is an amazing, an amazing thought. You know, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, the Bible talks about how the words are living, how they're quick and they're powerful. The Word of God is quick and it's powerful, you know, and it, and, and, it, and it knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This book is alive and living and you are really having a real, you know, a communion, if you will. When you sit down and you, and you read your Bible, try not to just go through the motions understand, like, this is time that I'm spending with God. Amen. This is time, when you're spending time with God's Word, you're spending time with God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, uh, we love you, Lord. We, we thank you for the great example of, of Abraham. We see that he was a, a great man and how <clears throat> he was able to have a friendship with you, dear Lord. We ask you that we could also uh, be obedient, dear God. We could keep your commandments. We could show you that we love you and that we could also uh, have a friendship in the same manner, dear God. We thank you for the great example of the, of the holy women and Sarah, dear Lord. Uh, we, we ask you that you would uh, continue to bless our Bible studies. Be with all of us, dear Lord. We ask you to be with uh, Mrs. Martinez and the new baby and the Martinez family and all of the women that are expecting as well. Just continue to bless our church. We're so thankful for everything you've done for us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.